Hello, um, welcome to ESMT Berlin. It's nice to have you all here today. It's very nice to have um, such a great person for an open lecture. In case you um, don't know me, my name is Martha Yulbrock. I head communications and marketing here at ESMT. Our open lecture series has been going on from about since 2009, I believe. And we've had um, a very interesting group of different speakers. We're very excited today to have the Deutschland Chief Financial Officer, Rachel MP here. She's going to be talking about, as you can read, M&A and digitization. I always say digitalization. Digitization. Two mutually reinforcing factors. In case you haven't been to ESMT before, you may notice that um, the building is a little bit older than the school. We were founded in 2002 by um, German industry, so multinational companies doing business in Germany. And um, the building itself is over 50 years old. It was the head of the East German government. And um, as you notice, many of the rooms are rather um, impressive in their size and scope. So I uh, wanted to tell you just a little bit about our speaker today. She's been the CFO at Telefonica since 2011. And since October 2014, she's taken on company strategy. I believe this will be very interesting to hear more about today. She uh, steered the successful IPO of Telefonica Deutschland in October 2012. This was one of the biggest listings in Germany in recent years. She also played a very decisive role in the successful acquisition of the E-plus group. From 2009, she was responsible for controlling at Telefonica in Germany and was one of those steering the company strategy for the successful LTE frequency auction. She started her career at Ernst & Young and then went to Lucent Technologies and she holds an MA in Mathematical Science from the University of Oxford. Today, I would like to, um, before I pass on to Rachel Impey, I would like to thank our long-standing media partner, Tagesspiegel, and also our moderator, Kevin P. Hoffman, who'll be taking the stage a little bit later. He's the head of the business section of the Tagesspiegel. Thank you um, to Telefonica very much today for cooperating on this event. I hope this is the start of a cooperation in this way and many others to come. So a warm welcome to Rachel and Pete. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, my topic for today, as you've heard, is around M&A and digitalization. My presentation is, is going to just try to be some food for thought for you. I've included a few numbers as it's an MBA course to keep it interesting, but I want to just uh, try to challenge the thinking a little bit in terms of how our lives have changed over the last few years. And for the younger members of the audience, the only life you've ever known, but for the older ones amongst us, the way it's changed in the last 10 or 20 years. Um, and also give you some food for thought in terms of what it might mean for your industry or for the industries that you're studying um, because digitalization will change the world and it's a revolution and, and no industry is exempt. So it's a food for thought presentation this morning uh, and I hope uh, you find something of interest. So let's start the discussion. I don't know how many of you have got your smartphones somewhere to hand or have already <laughs> glanced at them during this presentation. Um, the concept of reading a phone is a little bit new. We used to use them for talking for the younger members of the audience. <laughs> Um, but if you take a step back and you have a look at my slide for a second, digitalization has completely changed the way you run your life, the way you communicate with your family, your friends, the way that you organize yourselves, the way that you do your job or you do your studies. And as a result of that, it's fundamentally changed the life of many companies and many industries. And some of those failures of those companies for the industries that have been changed forever happen very quickly and very unexpectedly, finally, some behemoths of industry of the 1970s and 80s are no more. And we've created companies in the last 10 years or so that have become the biggest and most profitable companies in the world, or at least the most valuable companies in the world. And they didn't exist when I was a student and when I was studying. And by that regard, the world has changed forever. I don't know how many of you have just taken the time to take a step back and really think about how great it is for our lives in terms of how digitalization has changed the way that we're able to do things, but also the impact it can have. When is the last time you bought an actual CD in an actual shop? 
or the last time that you booked a holiday sitting with a travel agent whilst they looked up in magazines to show you where you might want to go. It's a concept that firstly those under 25 probably don't know and for those of us were, was a distant memory from the past. But it's also a wake-up call that says you can fundamentally destroy huge businesses within five years and you can create powerful businesses within five years because the revolution and the digitalization that that brings is enormous. The biggest hotel company in the world doesn't own any buildings. The biggest taxi company in the world doesn't own any cars. If you read the front page of the FT today, there's an article about how Brussels is trying to find uh, a legislatory route for the European Union to deal with Uber and to deal uh, with all of those models that the, the world is not ready for in terms of tax legislation and regulation. And guess what? Business models and business frameworks are not ready for it either, but people are busy making a lot of money from it and people are busy losing a lot of money because of it. So you need to be ready. The uh, alarm clock in the middle of my slide is a wake-up call um, because if you were in the alarm clock manufacturing business, you're probably also in trouble because you probably haven't thought about it, but your business model doesn't exist anymore. So that is what my presentation is about today. Um, maybe we go on a journey now as we maybe try to use my industry, the telecommunications industry, as a bit of an example to talk us through what might happen and what can happen and, to be honest, what has happened to us and the kind of uh, things you need to think about, whether you're in business, whether you're a student, um, in terms of how you may want to approach your industry or the things that you want to do. So the telecommunication industry used to be relatively straightforward. We built a network, people bought a phone, they made calls. That was quite straightforward. What's happened since then is there's now content and over-the-top operators Smartphones provide an amazingly different service than just enabling you to phone your friends and family. And the overall business model now looks significantly different than it did before. The traditional barriers to entry have been dissolved by digitalization, which changes the role that each individual business and each individual participant can play in the overall value chain for the industry. Some players and some parts of the value chain are subsidizing others, and there is not a level playing field in terms of the legal, tax and regulatory environment in which we play. And that is a result of the amazing jump forward that technology and digitalization has brought to our industry. It's a huge opportunity, but it's a huge risk and a threat, depending on how smartly your part of the value chain is managed and how well you manage your position within that value chain. To give you an example, the uh, symbols at the top of the chart represent the over-the-top operators, which is what telecommunications companies call the very clever digital companies who have created digital services that flow over the top of the infrastructure. They're not our favorite services, clearly you can imagine, but nevertheless, that concept didn't exist 10 years ago. Uh, we lost 25% of our SMS revenue in one year, not five years, not 10 years, in one year, as a result of the establishment of a different type of service and a different type of data product that our customers love. If you think about how you communicate with your friends and family, or depending on your age with your children, it's not the same as it was five years ago, and it will not be the same in five years' time. So we, as an industry, have had to fundamentally assess our role in the value chain, how we want to participate and how we want to play our operating model, to make sure that we have a future-proof strategy and a future-proof position in this changing world. And every industry has to go through the same thought process and has to go through the same analysis. Going back to my original slide, this is not something that is unique to the technology center and the technology industry. It affects every industry in a different way with a different impact over time. I promised some numbers. It's an MBA course after all. Um, very briefly, I don't want to bore you, this is a chart that looks at the end-to-end -end operating model of the telecommunications market and looks at the percentage of operating cash flow per part of the market and looks at the equity valuations and enterprise valuations associated with the businesses in that segment of the market. The very simple conclusion is, if you're a telco, you continue to be the biggest player in terms of generating operating free cash flow. 
Hooray, you've all learnt that generating cash is the most important thing you can do if you're a business. However, you can also see we have a fair representation of valuation. Not so bad, huh? But if you have a look here at the digital services, also my friends, the over-the-top players, what you can see is that they have essentially 12% of the operating free cash flow and normal, almost double the amount of valuation. You can take the valuation as the market's estimation of potential for the future. <clears throat> so the good news is, I've got as much potential as I've got operating free cash flow. That's not a bad place to be, and I've got a lot of free cash flow. That's not so bad. But my potential, my strategic positioning for the future is not considered as strong as my new competitors who are sitting in a different part of the value chain for the telecommunications industry. I need to think about that very seriously, and you need to do the same analysis when you're thinking about your industry or your sector in terms of how is the value distributed and where is the potential and where will the potential come from. So let's go back to the bigger picture and start to build the bridge between digitalization and why that might be relevant in association with thinking about M&A. So in my world, as in many industries, we firstly have a very challenging position when we think about being in the European markets relative to being in China or the US. So if you look in the US, there's 300 and something million um, inhabitants. There are four mobile operators and one regulator. If you're an operator in Europe, there are 740 million or so people in Europe. There are 27 regulators and there are 60-something mobile operators. In a world where just building your network and letting people use their phones for calls over your network is over, where you're in a world where customers have a completely different expectation in terms of uh, capacity and uh, ubiquity of network connectivity, the need for scale as a fundamental right to play is crucial in terms of being able to compete within your country, but also on a global scale. So if you think about what you used to expect from your phone, if the voice call was slightly muffled, it was kind of OK, because you could still hear what the other person was saying. Now, when you download the attachment to your email, you know exactly how long it takes. And you're sitting for four or five seconds going, come on, how bad is this network? It's a completely different expectation that you have in comparison to what you expected from your mobile phone, work, phone network 10 years ago. And that has a huge implication for us in terms of continuous levels of investment, high levels of capital expenditure, uh, clearly with all of the risks that go with upfront cash investment, um, but also, as you've just seen, completely different players with whom we need to compete who have a completely different business model and a completely different demand for cash. Which means that the traditional uh, search for scale in many infrastructure-based industries was important. In a digital world, it's an even more basic hygiene factor that you need to be able to have any chance to compete on a long-term basis, because you need to be able to have that basic scale of economics to enable, enable you to be able to invest to compete at a basic level before you even begin to play in terms of your ability to compete in terms of digital over-the-top services. <coughs> So the search for scale remains crucial in many infrastructure-led industries, particularly ours, but it doesn't solve all of the digital challenges that I showed you at the very beginning of the presentation. It just gives you the right to play on a long-term basis. I like the quote on the right-hand side. Um, it's a long time ago since I left Ernst & Young, but it's still nice to see some innovative uh, thinking. Um, I think it's maybe, it's, it's maybe not that uh, earth-shattering, but nevertheless, I think it sums it up very well. What I said at the beginning, this isn't happening slowly, this is happening incredibly quickly. And the ability for businesses to change and evolve organically is a huge challenge. And thus, firstly, you need to assess your business model, but you also need to think about who the competition is because it's probably not the competition that you thought it was five years ago or even two years ago. And often one of the tools that you need to employ to be able to continue to be competitive in the long term is M&A. And it, here you see it, can the change really happen quickly enough if you try and do it yourself? What you see down the left hand side of the page is probably very familiar to you if you're an MBA student. It's good textbook stuff. 
Um, but you can read it in two ways. You can read it with your old school hat on, um, thinking about why you might want to do M&A in a traditional world, but it's still very relevant when you think about a digital world. I've highlighted some of the examples here. Outstanding customer experience matters hugely, whether it's happening in an analog face-to-face -face world or if it's a digital over-the-top service. And you may need to do M&A to serve both of the markets that are very relevant to your customers, and that's absolutely true about our industry and about our business. Strengthening your competitive advantage, you need to decide what that competitive advantage is and then find the right M&A to help you fuel that process. But nevertheless, you need a very clear strategic vision of what exactly it is you're trying to achieve. And actually what's very important for, for us in our business is the final point, synergies uh, and cost base. Because for me to be able to continue to compete in the long term, I need the scale, I need the cost savings to be able to invest in new technologies and to be able to uh, invest in differentiated digital services. So although some of the ideas down the left-hand side still look like the textbooks that I read a number of years ago, they are still incredibly relevant from a strategic perspective when you're thinking about the role of M&A, but you need to think about it in a different strategic context in terms of what's going to be able to drive your business for the future. So before we come to the M&A transaction that I've had the pleasure of being involved in for the last few years, some examples of recent interesting M&A activity um, and I split it down into, into old school companies and new world companies. I'm sure they would hate me for doing so but nevertheless I wanted to make a point. My point is some of the more traditional businesses who've been around for a while and have been successful in evolving their business model have understood the need for change. So um, BMW, I mean, I live in Munich, so it's a good example. Um, we all know that they've evolved their business model through planes and automobiles and motorbikes and, and all sorts of things. Um, and they've managed to still be innovative alongside their other uh, automotive uh, partners there. It's a world where they have moved together with their hottest competition. I think you very rarely see Daimler and BMW collaborating um, because they recognize the need for digital innovation and the need that that was then core to their core business, so they've actually bought a digital maps company to facilitate their in-car customer experience. So a very traditional set of businesses who have evolved and who have managed to live through many iterations already are innovating in terms of the kind of services that they need to buy. Or E.ON, it's a very interesting energy market here in Germany, but that's for another day, um, here have bought an energy efficiency company because clearly they recognize that there is a different adjacent business model in which they could participate and that that could be complementary to their existing business because actually they're seeing falling energy consumption in certain industries and difficult margin squeezes in some industries anyway. But also on the right hand side, let's say the, um, the younger companies, maybe some of them even didn't exist when I was at university, um, they are also recognizing that they need to evolve their business model very fast if they want to stay ahead of the game and if they want to have potential that is really valued by the market. There are some very high profile, very well known ones there. Um, you see uh, Facebook as a good example. You also see um, Tsing looking at recruitment solutions and digital recruitment solutions as an obvious digital enhancement of their business model. So going back to the big strategic picture, the strategic evaluation of the space in which you're in, how the different placing of the players and how digitalization changes the barriers to entry and changes the role that each of those participants needs to take in the market is crucial to understanding your strategy. Then you need to understand what your strategic differentiation is and then work out what you're going to do about it. And clearly M&A is a very fast tool that can enable you uh, to leapfrog the competition if you buy the right company at the right time at the right price, which is always the challenge. So, let's come a little bit to back to reality, if you like, and back to the journey that we've been on over the last few years. Um, you heard that we listed Telefonica Deutschland in 2012. Um, it was the biggest IPO in Europe in 2012, and we became the biggest listed company on the tech DAX. That was very important um, because it gave us a tradable commodity and a valuation for our business 
that was finally a crucial lever in enabling us to participate in the transaction where Telefonica Deutschland bought E plus uh, from KPN, and KPN is the Dutch incumbent telecommunications uh, company. This transaction um, combined the number three and the number four mobile operators in the German market. You probably know Telefonica Deutschland by the O2 brand, uh, for those of you who don't know the business, and you probably know the E plus group uh, maybe by the base brand, the Blau or the Simeo brands. Um, so uh, a big combination of very important consumer brands in the German market and also something that fundamentally changed the scale of our business forever, turned us from the number three and number four operator in terms of customer numbers to the number one operator. Yes, we have more customers in mobile than Deutsche Telekom does and that fundamentally changes the way that the business works in Germany. So we have 47 uh, customer accesses, so one in every two Germans has some kind of connection with us on average. Um, it means we have 37% market share, uh, particularly of the mobile market, and we went from being a 5 billion euro revenue company to being an 8 billion euro revenue company. The numbers look nice, but it goes back to my point from earlier. This scale, an opportunity to monetize this scale, and to invest in one set of infrastructure makes a huge difference in terms of our ability to compete in this new and ever-changing market. The strategic rationale, coming back to why it's very important to know why you're doing it, um, is actually relatively traditional. This was not about our ability to be able to be the digital uh, innovator of the future immediately. It was about gaining the scale and, and the financial firepower to be able to compete for the future. Um, and it enabled us, uh, if you like, with three key pillars to drive our business forward. So firstly, um, the scale point on the left enabled us to focus on superior customer experience. That means investing in one network and not two. You don't need to be a rocket scientist to work out that that helps you significantly in terms of customer quality. Uh, but at the same time, it enables us to have the best uh, customer experience in terms of distribution network both online and offline within the German market which is also crucial uh, in a world uh, where explaining technology and explaining digitalization is hugely important for many sectors of the market. Of course I'm a CFO as well as a strategy director, I like synergies. Um, this is a 5 billion euro NPV synergy case with a run rate of 800 million euros of operating free cash flow savings in the fifth year. To give you an idea, the free cash flow of our business before we bought E+, was order of magnitude four or 500 million a year. So this is very material in terms of free cash flow generation for the business. Uh, and finally, the translation of that into shareholder value creation. Um, that difference in scale can make the difference between very, very average margins and free cash flow generation and finally best in class margins and free cash flow generation because the benefit of scale is so great. The other thing I would say in terms of having a strategic rationale, PowerPoint is great, results are better. Um, we did the acquisition 20 months ago now um, and one of the crucial parts of the success that our business has had is being able to clearly deliver proof points against the strategic rationale already in the first year post-integration. Remember what I said at the beginning, the world moves fast and actually my 800 million euros come in the fifth year because the integration of an infrastructure business takes time. Hugely important that you're able to generate value uh, for the relevant stakeholders quickly. And what you can see here is in terms of uh, creating superior customer service, we have had a significant number of customer awards in terms of improved or even best-in-class customer experience around our shops, our call centers, and improvements in our network capability. And it's important to service the investment community, but also your customers, as the most important stakeholder that you have. Secondly, um, Synergy Capture. I mentioned my 800 million euro uh, operating free cash flow target in 2019. In the first year, we were able to generate 35% of that target. Um, and that's a crucial proof point in terms of the strategic rationale that we're able to deliver to the markets. And that actually uh, flowed through in terms of a clear turnaround in, in EBITDA growth. 
So the acquisition went through uh, in the fourth quarter of 2014, and you can see that it immediately flowed through uh, in terms of profitability gains, and we've consistently delivered profitability growth quarter by quarter since the acquisition went through. So I told you that the acquisition did go along the lines of those strategic imperatives that I talked about earlier. But at the same time that it wasn't the end of the story for us, it was the beginning. It gave us the scale and the firepower and the cash generation ability to be able to compete and to be able to have a long-term future. But clearly, it was only one step on the digital journey in us being able to address that new competition that I was talking about at the beginning of my presentation. So the strategy of our business going forward clearly continues to focus on giving the best customer experience to our customers, whether they're wholesale partners, retail customers, or business customers. And that remains our core business, and it generates our uh, couple of billion euros of EBITDA every year, our eight or nine hundred million of cash flow every year, and our eight billion euros of revenue. That's a core market which, of course, we're trying very hard to, to defend and even grow. But at the same time, we have to identify how that change of technology and change of digitalization is changing the opportunity and the adjacent markets to our market, which will enable us also to find new sources of revenue for the future. Our core, if you like, raw material of the past was connectivity, so data connectivity. It's changed from voice and SMS to data over time, but now our core raw material is data connectivity. Our new raw material, if you like, is data and analysis of data. We actually have, on an anonymized level, fabulous insights in terms of um, customer movements, customer behaviors, uh, and a number of really interesting customer insights that can be hugely powerful for all manner of things uh, across different industries, from retail to city to travel, really across many industries, the information we have is hugely valuable. And it's actually very valuable even for our core business. Um, that is what we call here advanced data analytics. Uh, and the internet of things, if I flip, flip to the next slide, the future of connectivity is amazing. So today, we are connected. So it used to be 25 years ago that our homes were connected. We all had a phone in the hallway. We used to talk to our parents. Then we uh, progressed to having uh, connected uh, PCs in our bedrooms. In the future, everything will be connected. So all of the electronic devices within your home, your fridge, your washing machine, everything, to your pet, your keys, your handbag, your bike, your luggage, everything will be connected and will be trackable. The connectivity <laughs> will be trackable. Um, the connectivity will also facilitate automization. We, of course, have all seen the vision of self-driving cars, well, the vision that is almost a reality. But the automization opportunities also with tracking that go through distribution or logistics or manufacturing clearly change fundamentally all of those industries forever. And the estimation of the size of the market or the size of value that the Internet of Things could create is bigger than the entire telecommunications industry in Germany. Um, and clearly, this basic connectivity is a hugely adjacent market to our market. And clearly, the data that comes associated with the Internet of Things further enhances that amazing source of, of data uh, that we potentially have as an industry. Data is a new asset. The concept that information about people could be the basis of evaluation of Google was unthinkable 10 years ago from my perspective. And data is a new asset where the control, management, regulation, ownership and access to data is a very <coughs> tricky subject from a legal and a regulatory perspective but is also a potentially huge source of value for consumers and for businesses alike. So this is a small glimpse, if you like, into the future world of, of my industry, but also uh, it's something that will have a huge impact on most industries, and an example of how digitalization and technology will fundamentally change our operating model and change the operation of our business. So, it's 
always good, uh, at least I used to find when I was a student, it's always good if your lecturer gives you a summary because it means that you can just take notes at the end. Um, <laughs> the three things that I essentially said to you today was remember the alarm clock. Um, I think it's very easy to become complacent that the world as it is today is it's just how it's always been. And actually you forget very quickly how fast your life has changed and how fast that has made a change for many industries and for many companies. So remember the alarm clock. Remember the diff different allocation of valuation. It's about potential. Capital markets and analysts are pretty smart. So they're pretty good at identifying who's got potential for the future. So not just thinking about how much cash you generate today, because we all learned that cash is king a long time ago. Actually, valuation is pretty damn important as well, because it, it identifies the likelihood of you having cash flow tomorrow as well as having cash flow today. And finally, um, the fact that M&A may seem completely disconnected from this discussion about digitalization, but actually it's the fastest way to bring fundamental change and to move into adjacent markets or to change and drive your business forward. And that old school companies as well as new world companies see the need to do something fundamentally different and that should be a wake up call for all industries to think about the way forward for them. With that I'd like to say thank you very much for your attention today, thank you very much for coming to listen um, and I think in a few minutes I'll take the opportunity to, to take some of your questions, so thank you very much. Figures. Um, tele <laughs> Telefonica, group number two in Europe, number four in the world. Um, close to 9,500 employees. Revenue, um, 7.888 billion euros in 2015. Some math expert CFO had his fun with that figure. Oh, it's a she. Um, <laughs> Rachel MP, CFO since 2011, and organized an IPO in October 2012. Oxford, oh, seems interesting. <laughs> um, well, my name is uh, Kevin Peter Hoffman. I'm head of the business section of, as I tell my Irish grandmother, the leading newspaper in the world, or at least. Um, your favorite newspaper, Der Tagesspiegel, and don't forget the online news website. Before I receive the honor to run my, um, my small department, uh, you could say a burden sometimes, um, that was two and a half years ago, I was an expert on, on energy and aviation topics, and, um, and many of the things we just heard really remind me of companies like Lufthansa, of RWE, and uh, the older ones amongst us uh, know that um, even Deutsche Telekom was uh, called Deutsche Bundespost once, so we had to deal with state-owned uh, companies who were really inflexible. And I'd like, like to invite you to keep the bigger picture in mind now when we talk about this, when this all starts to take place, from my perspective, maybe in the middle of the 1990s, when all these sectors were beginning to be liberalized and um, maybe that was one, one starting point when it all um, began. And you are very welcome to um, share some thoughts with us, but first of all I would like to um, do a short interview with, with Mrs. Ra Rachel MP. Thank you very much. Um, I can leave that there now. It's great to have the biggest market share, of course, uh, to be a market leader. There always to, seems, seems to be a certain percentage of people that uh, want to be customers of the market leader. Maybe because they think this company must have done something right, otherwise they wouldn't be uh, on the top of the list. It may be a psychological effect, maybe the same reason why lots of people uh, become fans of Bayern Munich. Uh, even if they don't live in Bayern. Um, in your case, to be honest, there were two my mobile underdogs in, in the German market, uh, O2NE Plus, with two grids, and these grids are being techni technically merged now. So my question is, to what extent does Telefonica have 
any benefit from the, the market leadership now? Have you already uh, gained new customers or is there any other indicator that would show us, well, there is some benefit from, from your, your new strategic position? Sure. Um, so I think two or three things. If you, if you look at it from a customer mm. perspective, I think the most important uh, quick benefit is the combination of the networks. Um, so uh, to try to not be too technical, uh, we've essentially taken two network grids and we're making them talk to each other. Um, which means that the density of sites that we have and thus the quality of service and the capacity of service that we can offer our customers is significantly better than it was before and with a significantly larger number of sites than Deutsche Telekom and Vodafone, particularly in urban areas, gives us an opportunity to differentiate particularly in 3G. And you saw in my slides, um, we've, and you'll know clearly the popularity of uh, consumer-based surveys in, in Germany in terms of test results, um, we've significantly improved and in some cases even won um, the network orientated customer experience tests, particularly in urban and suburban areas. Um, I think that's the, the, the most visible and, and quickly very relevant and important factor for customers in terms of why the combined business is better than the others. There are some more clearly in terms of um, the distribution network. We're able to offer a much broader uh, shop distribution network than before. Um, and also as we invest into new technology, everybody's talking about LTE and 4G, our ability as a combined business to invest in a great network of the future is significantly enhanced in comparison to when we were standalone businesses. So from a customer perspective, I think that there are very clear benefits already. And clearly you saw in my slides also that from a stakeholder perspective, from shareholder perspective, we can also drive um, a better financial performance, which is great for shareholders in the short term, but also great for customers in the future because if it gives us much greater financial strength to invest. In the search of scale, we learned that um, longer operators earn an overproportional share of the market's cash flow, which seems logical. So the target is to obviously to gain market share, to become large. On one chart, uh, you're shown. Um, you compared the maps of the US, China and Europe mm -hmm. with all the national flags, which was quite impressive. Could you please describe what are the specific challenges of growing in Europe? Mm. Obviously, we have got several currencies, still have different languages, but what are other challenges of doing business, of growing? In, sure. In so I think during that slide, I, I reminded you, if you look at the, the population of the US versus the population of Europe, you look at the number of operators and also the number of regulators, that also fairly roughly uh, translates into the number of uh, tax uh, systems, the number of legal systems, the number of regulatory systems within which we need to operate. And clearly what we've seen a number of years ago, if you just look at the telco sector, Europe was the innovator on a global scale and, and Europe was seen as really the place to be. That has somewhat reversed in comparison to the US in the last five years particularly due, I think, to those legal tax and regulatory mm. issues that say, you know, relatively speaking, of course Germany is a very big place, but in comparison to the US, the benefits for scale and investment that you can get are at a completely different scale. So I think those kind of framework constraints that we have, which clearly are trying to be addressed, there is clearly a, a pan-European agenda in terms of trying to have a different regulatory environment, but quite frankly it doesn't move quickly enough to enable us to be able to move at the speed at which technology is moving. And that was somehow my point from the, the very first slide. Front page of the, e, of the FT today is talking about the European uh, Union trying to find a framework within which they could provide legal and regulatory guidance for all of the European member states around how to deal with over-the-top and um, sharing economy type business models such as uh, Uber and Airbnb. We don't have a framework that is ready for the models of the future that constrains technology and digital companies in terms of they're able, how they're able to invest. So I think that's a critical aspect of when you compare Europe uh, with some of the, the opportunities that, that lie in, in But are in there any, any advantages as well? You could say, if you can do it in Europe, you can do it everywhere. Or is there, um, is there any chance in this fragmented yeah um, of course I mean of course the obvious uh, point that has been discussed for some time is um, what M&A what cross-border M&A might happen within our industry within Europe mm. and that for me is clearly an mm. opportunity 
please don't think that's me saying Telefonica Deutschland is going to go and buy lots of companies. Um, but nevertheless, I do think that in five years' time, the map of companies within the European footprint will look different. And I think that that will be geographical consolidation, but potentially also um, cross-business. So telcos acquiring into adjacent spaces and vice versa, because I think the blurring of competition has already happened. And thus, I think that there is benefit in consolidation between adjacent industries, as I was showing you the value chain of the overall space earlier. As we are talking about Europe and your British citizen, I need to ask you on the Brexit topic. Uh, um, what, what, what would a Brexit mean for your company and for your business in general? Mm -hmm. So firstly, um, I should do the disclaimer, any comments on the Brexit are my personal views and not the views of my company, of course. Um, I mean, finally, Telefonica Deutschland, we are a German business, we are headquartered in Germany, um, and we don't have so much dealings with the UK. So clearly, it's not the potentially same impact if you were talking to, to somebody who was on the board of a company that operates in every country across Europe, including the UK. Um, my personal view, however, is that um, if there were to be a Brexit, it will bring uncertainty into, into Europe for some period of time. And that clearly will put some challenges from an economic perspective into the market, into the mix uh, across Europe. So I don't think it's a particular issue for Telefonica Deutschland because we're Germany orientated, but I do think it will bring some added uncertainty to a quite complicated framework from a geopolitical perspective already within Europe. So I think from that perspective, you can probably read my personal view. I believe I'm a European citizen just because I have a British passport is, is something to do with the past. But nevertheless, um, I think Telefonica Deutschland, because we're focused on Germany, is finally relatively isolated mm. from any positive or negative impact from the Brexit. Okay, I'll leave it with that then. Um, um, in the invitation text to this lecture, we read M&A processes boost that change dynamics within companies as structures and workflows are scrutinized. Well, scrutinized is sometimes a nicer word for demolished. Either way, it sounds dynamic, it sounds uh, like progress we all want, don't we? Um, on the other hand, I wonder, M&As, even IPOs, put quite an amount of pressure on, on uh, every employee from top to bottom. Uh, change also meets um, stress. People might become uncertain, begin to feel insecure about their jobs. Um, employees hate the word synergy very often. Uh, they might lose perspective, even loyalty to their own company. What are your experiences in, with employees, with labor unions, with Betriebsräte, as we call them in Germany? Mm -hmm. um, and just take your case for, uh, as an example, of, obviously, for, for the whole M&A business. Sure. So going back to your original comment at the beginning, we saw this as an opportunity not just to drive synergies per se, but an opportunity to look at the processes within the business and not try to merge some processes, but to try to, dr to drive some transformational processes that would be good for the business for the future and to design the business that we want it to be. Clearly that is a journey and it's a journey that never ends, but when you have to do a lot of change and a lot of integration anyway, it's a good opportunity to try to redesign and try to do transformation at the same time. And in terms of how that affected our employees, I think one of the crucial aspects was around leadership, vision, and, and a clear strategic direction for the business. The fact that we had to go through merger control with the European Union meant that we actually had 15 months between signing the deal and um, being, being able to merge the businesses. And in those 15 months, we spent a lot of time uh, finalizing and refining the strategy and the operationalization, and thus how we were able to articulate to our employees what it was all about. And we had a team, the leadership team of 80 people in place on day one, who were then able to give direct operational leadership to each of the individual employees. So really every employee within a combined business knew where they were from day one in terms of how they reported and what their role in the transformation was. I think that was very important for taking everybody on the journey. But of course, nevertheless, we have reduced our headcount during that process. And we believe in being as upfront with everybody as possible and as fast as possible in executing change to give everyone as much certainty as we could. And as part of that, our collaboration with our supervisory board, our Betriebsräte, has been very positive because we've been very open, honest and upfront from the beginning and have been very clear in terms of the strategic intent of what we needed to do. 
Another interesting aspect, I think it was in your presentation, was that you said companies under um, um, pressured or, or that are within change don't have time to establish uh, new hierarchies. And um, well, but how does that feel in, in everyday work life if, if you live, uh, live and work in an environment that um, well doesn't take much respect for hierarchies or uh, leave room for, for establishing your hierarchies mm -hmm. from a management perspective? So, I mean, I think what was crucial was what I said before, which was making sure that the, the, the top leadership of the organization were very clear in terms of the strategic intent and the operational plan that went beneath. But then as a leadership team, we are, how can I put it, maybe confident enough to empower leaders down the organization or even employees that within the framework that, they, that we've set, they should find the best way of doing things. So really to say you are empowered um, during this time of change and during this transformation process, this is what we're trying to achieve. You need to tell us how we should do it. And I think that's about confidence of leadership and confidence in your people and having the right culture and, and the right proactive people who love our company and who love working for the brands that we have, that they also want to find the right way through and to find the right solutions. But it definitely takes um, confidence and trust and um, a mutual respect for the skill sets of the people that we have, that actually crowdsourcing solutions for these problems is much better than thinking that you have the answer. It was also very fascinating what you said about the advanced data analytics, big data and the Internet of Things. Um, everybody is looking for the silver bullet, of course, but... Um, and you have described how very established companies, for, as BMW or Daimler, for instance, by smaller companies that might have the power to disrupt uh, the industry or push the industry forward. Mm. What I would like to know from you is what kind of attitude uh, does an established company need to in order to make these acquisitions a success? Mm. I think that's a really good question. Um, I think there are more examples than we could all manage to remember of large companies who have bought smaller, more innovative companies and have killed them. Um, and I think that the answer here is you need to think very carefully about when you buy a company, firstly, what I was saying earlier, why you're buying it and what you're trying to achieve, and make sure you have a plan that actually follows that through. And secondly, that you find a setting within your corporate setting that, enable that enables that business to actually do what you wanted it to do. And that may mean integrating it into your organization, or it may mean carving something out of your organization and reverse integrating it into the business that you've bought because what you must avoid doing is trying to make the business that you've bought like the company that you are, because otherwise you wouldn't have bought them. Um, and from my perspective, particularly for these innovative, digitally orientated acquisitions, this is a really important concept to think about what is it you're trying to achieve with that business and make sure that you give them the space to be able to do that and don't swamp them with your corporateness, if you know what I mean. <laughs> How does your company handle revolutionary ideas, honestly? Um, so I think firstly, in comparison to many industries, um, we are quite a, we're quite used to change and innovation. So our, um, our pricing cycles, our replacement cycles are naturally very short. We're used to working with Apple and Samsung in terms of handset replacement cycles and all of the innovation that comes with the technology. So I think um, although we're not Google or Facebook, we are still nevertheless used to a very innovative environment and having to adapt to a market that has changed fundamentally. Um, and we like to think that we're very innovative. So um, if, you, if you look at our culture, um, it's very orientated on being customer orientated, finding new solutions, finding new ideas, and being able to, to drive them and to drive commercial success from them. And so I think that culturally, we're actually very, very open-minded and very good in terms of finding those ideas. Nevertheless, of course, we're not as successful as I would like us to be in terms of driving them all to profitability. Um, and that's got a lot to do with the big machine is running, and it's, we're a very big company these days, and finding the right way to take the new ideas into the big machine and to make money from them is, of course, the challenge. In the same way as I was describing taking smaller acquisitions and incorporating them into your business. 
But nevertheless, I think culturally we've got the right employees with the right attitude to find a way to be even more successful with that. My favorite and final question as a reporter when I oh interview C <laughs> CEOs or CFOs is um, that claim to have all the answers to the digital revolution. I like to ask them, have you ever booked a taxi with Uber or my taxi, which is more established in Germany? Have you ever posted anything on Snapchat? The answer is usually, uh, usually no. And by the way, I've never done that, but um, I'm a journalist and I don't claim to know all the answers, but did so you ever a book a taxi? I'm a regular my taxi app user and okay. I pay digitally, I don't use cash, and yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, I am also a social media user, I'm a, so you can look me up if you would like to. So yes, absolutely, I'm sorry to break the mold. Um, no, but <laughs> <laughs> you've done the test all right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So uh, thank you very much for the moment, uh, Rachel MP. And now I would like to um, invite you to ask some questions to some of the stated topics here. And um, is maybe the gentleman in the front? Yeah, hi, my name is Nick Barham, I'm the program director here at ESNG. One of my sorry. Yeah, one of my roles here is to develop new programs, and I'm just wondering, from your perspective, what does a company like Telefonica miss in terms of the graduate market? And what should business schools be, be working on with, with new programs? What sort of programs should we be developing to help you to find the talent that you want? Great question that I wasn't expecting. Um, no, no, it's fine. Um, I mean, I think if you listen to recruiters within big companies today, and I think we have a representative of our HR department here today, um, I don't think I would be being unfair where the biggest buzzword of the day is digital skills. Everybody wants digital skills. Um, I think the, the challenge for you guys is what does that actually really mean? For some companies, just the attitude and the skill set that comes with somebody being under 25 when most of their workforce is over 45 or 50 clearly helps. But I think from my perspective, and clearly I'm a, I'm a strategist and a CFO, the kind of discussion we were having today around um, what does digital really mean in terms of business models and operating models. So the combination of having a good view on, on economics, uh, more business orientated studies, but a knowledge in terms of what digital capability is actually about. The combination of those three is very valuable, but with the final piece that goes with it, which is um, how can I put it nicely, socially orientated leadership skills because often the more digitally orientated candidates we see are not such good potential leaders and, and um, business people because the combination is what's so critical. I hope that's a little bit helpful. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. in the middle. Hello, Elena Aminova, Free University of Berlin. Thank you for your lecture. Um, if we look at M&As in terms of innovations, it's not uh, the safest way to innovate. There are at least several more ways which are much safer, for example, open innovation or co cooperations mm -hmm. with other institutions. Which brings me to the idea that in order to purchase another company, you need to be pretty sure about your future. How does your future look like? How can you imagine your company in 10 years? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. So maybe firstly to, to, to address your point, I agree. I think if you're looking for in innovation and digitalization, you have to look at a number of routes for which internal innovation is crucial because your internal people have the best understanding of your business, your capabilities and your business model today and thus they have a great opportunity to innovate. Partnerships and collaborations are definitely important and you need to choose where and with whom you should partner and make it a core skill set, particularly as we go into the world where business models and markets are merging and thus it becomes less clear who's competing with whom. But nevertheless, I still think it's important that in some instances you just need to own the technology, the IP, the skill set, or the people that have those thoughts. Well, so I think no, the they're high. I agree. But I think if you also look at self-innovation, the failure rates are also pretty high and pretty much the same. Um, and particularly if you come from big corporates, 
um, we don't have a very good success rate in terms of really innovating. I think, yes, we can be innovative in adjacent markets, but really innovating. We all know that the, the failure rate in startups is even less. Um, so I think in all of these areas of innovation, it's a risky business and you have to accept failure. Um, but that is part of the journey. And if you're not prepared to accept failure, finally, you're probably not going to innovate. Your question in terms of how do I see our business in 10 years' time, um, I'm very clear, communication and connectivity will still be the heart of our business. Everybody comes to me and says, oh, tomorrow you're going to be a digital business, that's great. Finally, we will still be a core connectivity business and it will still be the major driver of our, our revenue and of our cash flow. But we will clearly be a different business in terms of our data focus and our analytical ability than we are today. Um, we seek a lot to, to one of your other questions, data scientists and data skills clearly in combination with business skills is critical. We seek a lot of those kind of resources to come into our business that we are seen as a data analytical and a data orientated business as a second stream to our connectivity business. I am Konstantin Korolev, I'm Professor of Leadership here at the SMT. So, and my question is related to your first commentary about uh, the data as an important raw material that's available now for making lots of uh, inferences about uh, human behavior and uh, basically many things that might be important for the society and the organizations. If you look inside the organizations, and, uh, theoretically an organization can have a lot of data about its own employees and uh, about their performance, about their capacity, about their abilities, which is definitely a difficult thing in Germany because uh, even performance is uh, in many instances prohibited to be monitored in this country. Uh, so what do you think? What is the future of data about the employees inside the organization for the productivity okay. and future of that organization? Mm -hmm. So I mean, I think firstly you're right. Um, the environment in Germany in general is generally more sensitive in terms of data security and data protection than many other markets. We can have a debate all day about the pros and cons of that, but it is how it is. Um, and for me, it comes back to one of the comments I made earlier that says also, um, I don't think that Germany or any of the other European markets is really ready from a regulatory and a legal perspective in terms of all of the potential sources of data for the future and all the potential opportunities that brings, whether it's commercial opportunities or also people development opportunities. Because I do think that being able to have data and analyze data can be very valuable for the individual as well as for the company, but it clearly needs a framework that is managed, that is um, protecting all of the stakeholders of that data. And I think in Germany, as in the rest of Europe, we need to progress more quickly with thinking about how the frameworks need to exist, that we can exploit the opportunities that data brings, rather than being frightened as that of something that we should, be, we should be trying to withdraw from, because I think otherwise we miss a big opportunity. And other markets who are maybe not so concerned about it may find, firstly, that they may have some downsides because they're not protecting people appropriately, but they may also be able to exploit some of that data and we may fall behind as a result of that here in Europe. My name is Graham Hawkins, I'm a freelance CFO. Um, you've spoken quite a lot about the user experience, you've also spoken quite a lot about scale. How does branding fit in between those two comments, particularly in an m and environment? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I think if I, I focus on, on my industry for a second, the German telecommunications industry is really interesting. Um, if you look at most telco industries across the world, there's a very limited number of brands that are in use, whereas in the German market you see probably 20 or 30 quite big brands that are established, some run by the telco operators, some run by retailers, others run by wholesalers of, of, of telecommunication services, which means that the market here is much more segmented and in smaller segments than you see in many areas. I don't think it means that branding is any less important, but it means that the brands are more focused in terms of the target segments that they're looking at. I think in an M&A scenario, Branding and how you manage branding is clearly very important. We are, of course, as part of our merger process, slightly reducing the number of brands that we're using because finally we have too much self-cannibalization of brands that are operating in the same network or in the same area, the same segment. Um, and that's something you have to handle very carefully because, you know, of course, there's a lot of brand equity associated with those brands and many customers who are attached to them. 
and thus we are very carefully managing those branding transitions and investing in the core brands and investing in them very heavily to be sure that customers feel comfortable in a time of change that, they've, you know, that they're with the right brand. And for the, the branding uh, moves and transitions that we're doing, we're also managing that very carefully because, of course, brand is relevant. But for me, it has to go alongside something that it stands for. So that brand needs to stand for customer experience and all the things that go with that for your relevant industry. Um, so for me, it's another part of the puzzle, but not the only answer. Um, because for me, otherwise, your brand doesn't really stand for something. Well, maybe one, one final question. I wondered the whole concept of blockchain, uh, which is being dis discussed in the, the banking sector, uh, even in the energy sector. We had one or two events in Berlin now. This whole concept that you don't need uh, a service provider in the middle. People can pay uh, directly. Uh, via complicated, um, <laughs> for me complicated at least, to understand um, processes. What, how might that change or disrupt uh, the telecommunications mm -hmm. company, this whole blockchain idea? I mean, I think from my perspective, there are many ways you can think of how our industry may evolve mm -hmm. in terms of the provider-customer mm -hmm. relationship. And you can even question exactly what will be the scope of service in the future. So what I mean by that is, um, I talked about basic connectivity, but also some of the content services that are important to you, be them email, video, music, social media, how we are provisioning those kind of services over time, how um, fixed line uh, connectivity, mobile connectivity, how the connectivity of all of the devices in your house that I was talking about earlier and the connections to your pet and your granny and your handbag, how they evolve over time and how that whole connectivity world evolves, I think is up for grabs in terms of operating model. What we still value very highly is a direct relationship with our customers because although connectivity is the heart of our business, I think there are many value-added aspects, particularly as we add those connectivity factors and value-added services over time that are valuable to the customer as well as being valuable to us. But clearly, there are some potential disruptors to that model over time, depending on how some things evolve. And hence why we will remain very focused on providing great core connectivity, but also enhancing that over time with the benefits of technology from data and from IoT mm. and from other value-added services. So there will always be a, well, in the foreseeable future, a uh, connection between the customer and the company. You're positive about that. That's a good message for the moment. Um, thank you very much for attending this open lecture. Thank you very much, Rachel MP, for this great lecture. Um, there are still some, some snacks and some drinks uh, in the lobby, so you're welcome to uh, come together there for a few moments. And um, yes, safe trip home or back to office, and um, goodbye, see you next time.